Jay Booksbaum here with a brand new swirl in a very, very special place here at the uh, Herzog Wine Library at Salt Restaurant. And I'm with my good old friend, Gib Getter. And I got a brand new friend too. And her name is Charlie Barracks, like, you know, Army Barracks. <laughs> and Charlie comes all the way from Northern California, from where the wine industry really in California is. And so guess what? Because we have this very special guest, we're gonna talk about California wines. So, Charlie, tell us about the first wine we're going to taste. Okay, so we're going to be tasting the Covenant Solomon Lot 70, which is like their flagship wine. It's the, um, it's a Cabernet, and it is 2019. Um, it's from the Napa Valley. It is actually, the lot is after the number in Gematria for uh, Yain. Um, so that's why it's lot 70. Um, I worked at Covenant for a little bit. I uh, did a little bottling there, a little harvest there. I didn't do this vintage, but we did bottle a Solomon um, and it was uh, pretty amazing. We did a Lavon and we also did a Cabernet. What, what's special about, Charlie, what's special about Napa? And also tell us a little bit about, uh, about Jody and uh, Jeff. Well, Jeff and Jody are really amazing. They run Covenant Wines, and they also have a winery in Israel as well. Um, the one I was in, obviously, was in California. It's in Berkeley, but they get their grapes from Napa. And these grapes are, obviously, they're from Napa Valley, and um, they have, you know, very special grapes. They have really great relationships with their growers, and it's pretty boutique lots. It's not, you know, really mass-produced, and so you have... So it's all really hand, high it's quality. All hand quality done. Yeah, and what, Jeff, what a lot of people don't know about Jeff is that he started out as a saxophonist. Yes. And then he went to be a wine writer, yes. which is where I met him, gosh knows how many wine, years ago. Yeah, wine spectator. Wine writer for the Wine Spectator. Yeah. And then he turned out to be a winemaker. Yes. <laughs> and he's done an amazing job. He has played saxophone in the cellar a few times. Um, and there's got to be something, there's something melodic about that saxophone in the cellar. You know. Saxophone of the cellar, yeah, it's pretty cool. He, we, we, um, we, I got to hear, hear him play a few times, and um, he's pretty, he's pretty great. So yeah, he, we, I also went to the vineyards with him, and he'll personally check the lots and check how the grapes are growing. Now, when when he decides to harvest a, a lot of wine, mm -hmm. uh, meaning a lot of grapes, mm -hmm. how does he do it? Does he do it with technical stuff, or does he taste the grapes? He does all of a kind of a combination of both from what I've seen. Um, he'll actually legit take some off the vine and taste it. Um, and then he'll also look at it and kind of see how things are growing. And Gabe, you've been around this business a little bit, a few, a few days, <laughs> right? So tell us what you know about Covenant and what you think about their wines and what makes it so opulent and so like, whoa, in the mouth. So Covenant was a very ambitious project that it's actually very symbolic that we're tasting the last 70. Solomon uh, from Covenant, their flagship wine. Uh, Solomon is the name, the Hebrew name of the co-founder of the winery, Leslie Rudd, mm -hmm. was very famous, he, he passed away a few years ago. A kosher winemaker, He Leslie? was not a kosher winemaker. Uh, I wanted to point that out. And, <laughs> but he believed in Jeff. Jeff wanted to uh, produce a world-class uh, wine in California from Napa Valley. And he convinced uh, Leslie uh, Leslie Rudd, Solomon, Shlomo Rudd, to uh, partner with him. Uh, and after a few years of working together already and producing some fantastic wines, uh, Leslie agreed to uh, give Jeff some of his very prized grapes from his own vineyard, uh, from the Rudd's vineyard, to produce uh, the Solomon uh, Lot 70. And uh, so this is really a tribute to uh, a tribute to him. What I find interesting is that Leslie's wines, Leslie Rudd's wines, some of his best wines go for hundreds and hundreds, and as they age, even thousands of dollars mm -hmm. a bottle. This wine, it's not cheap, but it's also the top, of the, you know, top of the line, and a tribute to Leslie. So it's in that. I think it it really tries to make it in that kind of quality uh, category, and I think. At, at about, what, $200 for Something the retail? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's taste it. Mm. Charlie and Jay, um, you were talking before about Jeff Morgan having started his career uh, as a saxophonist. Uh, he was actually part of the Monte Carlo uh, official jazz orchestra uh, for uh, Prince Rainier. And wow. 
there is a great connection actually between music and wine because you know there, there are two terms in music the melody and the harmony mm -hmm. so i would consider the melody to be like the profile the general profile of wine mm -hmm. and the um, and the harmony to be the balance and uh, those are a very essential uh, thing yeah. oh, about great. music that are also great. extremely essential about making uh, great wine Absolutely. and you have the, the beautiful uh, melody here it's a big bold complex uh, Napa cab and with a fantastic harmony fantastic balance yeah. you know it's interesting also about it, if I may it, there are a lot of good violinists okay but the best violinist using a strata Strata, Stradivarius, Stradivarius mm -hmm. is going to have a much better sound than the best violinist using, you know, a two hundred dollar violin. And I think one of the important things that that Jeff does is that he's so careful about his raw materials. He's yes. so careful about the grapes he yes. chooses. And so there's another example of, you know, you could you could kind of harmonize and put together, uh, a, you know, a great bottle of wine or you know a great mu musical song mm -hmm. but if the voices behind it aren't great you know the better the voices behind it the better the end product is going to be let's go to the next wine absolutely go ahead so we have the Hagafen Pinot Noir mm -hmm. also from Napa Valley actually uh, so Hagafen was the first fully kosher winery uh, in uh, Napa Valley from 1978 or 79 uh, by Ernie and Irit uh, Weir a state winery. Most of their wines are produced from their own grapes, their own vineyards, uh, most of which surround the, the winery on the Silver Road Trails. It's an incredible location uh, in Napa Valley. It's pretty much of a boutique operation like, uh, like Covenant, producing around 10,000 cases a year. Uh, and uh, the Pinot Noir is just a beautiful expression of the grape uh, from that region. Napa Valley is not a cold climate. And yet, you know, you have microclimates and uh, with uh, proper vineyard management, uh, you get uh, fantastic wines. Uh, and this is a very good example of, uh, of Napa Valley Pinot Noir and uh, one that is actually served here in this great restaurant, Salt, uh, in Long Branch, New Jersey. But one of the things I've always known about Pinot Noir is winemakers tell me this personally all the time. It's the winemaker's wine. And the reason why it's the winemaker's wine, unlike or more so than I should say a Cabernet or a Merlot or a Chardonnay is because the wine is so sensitive mm -hmm. at grape stage. Yes. The skins are thin, they're very sensitive. If you beat them up, you know, they won't turn out to they won't turn out a good juice product. And so the winemaker has much more of an input of how badly or well he can make this wine Absolutely. happen in, in the end. It's also and, really yeah. unique to grow Pinot Noir in, in Napa Valley because the climate um, is very, you know, they're, since they're so sensitive, if it's too hot, it could be a problem. If it's too cold, it can be a problem. And, you know, I, I grew up near Napa Valley and I went to Hagafen Cellars pretty much every time I could since I was 21. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I, you know, it can get hot there. So, you know, it really is a winemaker's uh, Great it's also, you notice, you notice the, the bottle is sweating a little bit. And the reason it's sweating a little bit is because here at Salt, they do the right thing. They, they keep it chilled. Now, it might, it, you know, from my experience, it shouldn't be served ice cold like Chardonnay, but it certainly shouldn't be served, you know, at room temperature or, or slightly lower than room temperature like Cabernet or other reds. It should be served a little bit chilled probably in the mid 50s I would say is it what would you say yeah, I, I would go a little higher probably around 60 degrees ish uh, because like you said you know it's a uh, it's a little bit of a more delicate grape uh, the, the the skins of Pinot Noir are thinner than much thinner than Cabernet Sauvignon and it produces much more delicate refined wine uh, that is usually m more medium bodied than full bodied like Cab uh, and that's uh, why you need to drink it a little uh, cooler. And I know I'm dating myself a little bit, but I remember sitting in Ernie's living room. That was his winery mm -hmm. office, anyway, and sitting in Ernie's living room in the late 70s, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the first wine that was released was a, uh, a late harvest ries. I'm sorry, a riesling, mm -hmm. and it was a late. Har actually, it was a late harvest riesling mm -hmm. that we brought to New York. And uh, man, it's been onward and upward ever since. Ernie's done a great job. The last wine today for this wonderful swirl is something called Four Barrels. And what I love about this wine is it's exclusive 
I mean, the guys here at Salt went to the winery in California. I just came back from there. Wow, what they're doing there, especially with our new winemaker, David Galzignato, is amazing. But the, the guys from Salt went to the winery. They, they chose four barrels out of, I don't know, something like 50, and they put together a blend. It's actually 38% Petit Verdot, 36% Cabernet. That's why it's four barrels. Uh, Zinfandel and Cabernet Franc. And so it's it's four varieties from four different barrels, and even those were taken from different barrels. And uh, you know, you can only get it here at Salt. It's called it's called Four Barrels by Herzog. So I'm um, very excited about it. I've tasted it. And uh, have you tasted it? Yes, it's a very uh, rich wine. But it's very approachable. Uh, it's the type of wine that uh, you know you can have in a restaurant. That's why it's here, also, mm -hmm. uh, so that you know it goes great with uh, all the great dishes that they make here. They have some fantastic dry aged uh, meat, beautiful uh, dry aging room, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not too tannic, uh, so that you can at least uh, enjoy throughout the meal uh, without overpowering uh, any of the food. And, and you're right, what I, what I like most about it is, as you said, it's still opulent and rich and full-bodied and fills up your mouth with fruit and chocolate and a little bit of vanilla, but none of that hard tannins, or I should say very little of those hard tannins. It's still got some tannins, so it's still got time to age, but mostly it's that fruit bomb flavor that you get. And when you have it with a salt steak, and I don't mean a steak that's salted. I mean a steak made by salt here <laughs> at Good Age. Uh, you know, it's gonna. It's just a fantastic combination. Well, this is Jay Booksbaum and my good friend Gabe and my new good friend uh, Charlie Barracks uh, here wishing you a really great one here at Swirl, right? Yes, thank you. Bechaim. <laughs>